All right. So we've had a chance to stretch our legs, and I'm going to change pace a little. You don't need to remember any complex facts here. Just a few clinical, a little bit of clinical information. I'm going to talk to you about a few patients. And I'm going to change location. I'm going to talk about pulmonary vein stenosis, and it's probably fairly uncommon. I'm not sure how many people would have seen a case of pulmonary vein stenosis in the room. I've seen probably half a, treated half a dozen maybe over the last 15 years at a busy tertiary centre. And there are a number of congenital and acquired conditions that can cause it. And I've seen a couple of these, sarcoidosis and fibrosing mediastinitis, but it's really the emergence of AF ablation that's put this condition sort of on the map. And perhaps one of the reasons I asked me to talk about it is that it's um, relatively uncommon. Few people in the room have seen it. So when these patients did present, it wasn't a diagnosis people thought about. Um, it was often sort of missed, not considered, and the patients presented quite late in the clinical course. Um, how does it present? Well, when you get a stenosis of a pulmonary vein and the stenosis starts to exceed about 50%, you start to get low bar con um, congestion, the wedge pressure in the lobe rises, and that in fact impacts on lung perfusion, so lung perfusion falls. This normally appears about three to six months after pulmonary uh, vein ablation or AF ablation procedure. And it tends, the presentation tends to be affected by the number of veins that are affected and by whether there is a cross venous collateral um, drainage. The patients present with progressive dyspnea. They get pleuritic chest pain, cough, and they may get homoptosis. And on the chest x-ray, it looks like a, a pneumonia. It can mimic pneumonia. They may get a pleural effusion. Um, and they'll get focal low bar congestion, just like pulmonary edema, but it's not um, distributed through both lung fields. It may be focused to one lobe. And so it can be perplexing. I mean, it was first reported when they began the early days of uh, uh, AF ablation, they started to notice that patients were presenting with this complication. And Robbins um, and his group first reported it uh, back in the, the late 90s. But techniques improved. They once they realized this could happen, they, with ice, with electromechanical mapping technologies, um, carefully positioning the catheters outside of the ostium of the, of the pulmonary veins, um, they're able to make this complication much less common. So up to 5% of patients in series have been affected by it. Not all of them are symptomatic. And in current literature, possibly 2 to 3% of patients with AF ablation might have some pulmonary vein stenosis. And there was a sense that, well, this new technology of cryoablation if we apply that, it may, or may, it may almost eliminate this problem. However, it hasn't. And recent uh, large randomized studies using cryoablation still shows that while it's less than 1%, pulmonary vein stenosis can occur, even with cryoablation. So I'm going to take you through a couple of cases, uh, change pace a little bit, and tell you about these uh, interesting um, people who suffered this complication. And each of these cases, I'll try and highlight a different aspect of uh, imaging or intervention in the case. Um, this is case one, and this was a 52-year-old businessman who had um, isolated atrial fibrillation, otherwise fit and well, troublesome, frequent symptoms, annoying more than anything. So he'd heard about this newfangled AF ablation procedure, wanted to have it done, had it done, and he got a lot better. The AF seemed to go away. Um, but about a month later, he developed progressive symptoms that were inexorably progressive. Shortness of breath, persistent cough, reduced exercise tolerance, he had an MRI and a CT to investigate these unusual symptoms, and um, pulmonary vein stenosis was diagnosed. Now, how did that happen? In fact, all of his pulmonary veins were stenosed. Well, when they do an ablation procedure, what they do is they take a volume-rendered CT uh, map that's done prior to the procedure, and they merge that with their electromechanical uh, map that they have in the lab at the time, so the two are merged um, with known reference points. Um, in a sort of virtual three-dimensional space that they use then to guide their intervention. And what they were trying to do at the time was to create a line of block around the pulmonary veins, isolate them electrically by creating a scar uh, that prevents conduction of ectopic beats out of the pulmonary veins. And so they're trying to ablate, as this is the map from that patient, in fact, this is the work that they did on him, uh, they're trying to create and isolate the pulmonary veins by creating RF ablation burns around, circumferentially around each of the pulmonary veins. What happened? If you don't get that merge right, you think you're at the ostium or isolating pulmonary veins, you may in fact be in the pulmonary veins doing your ablation, inducing your burn, and thereby inducing scar. And this patient, 
every one of the veins was stenosed, some of them critically, um, one of them moderately. So that's a nasty situation to be in. He was on home oxygen when I saw him. He'd been to a cardiac surgeon. They said, look, heart lung is about all we can do for you. Um, so that's, you know, an otherwise fit young businessman who had a troublesome condition now faces a heart lung uh, transplant. And we'd, at that stage, early 2000s, we'd, we'd uh, read about the potential to stent these. Uh, and by adapting our stenting techniques, transeptal puncture, wiring these veins and then using peripheral stents from the renals or the iliac type stents or we were able to adapt this to treat this patient. We used seven to nine millimeter peripheral stents, palmer shats and Herculean stents and this is what it looked like after we'd stented him. So we put a wire up into each of these veins and placed a stent and his symptoms have disappeared within 24 hours. Um, and we followed him up long term. Now we have more than five years follow up. He's completely resolved this condition. Um, so some important learnings there and some other interesting learnings in this next case. This is a 45 year old woman. She was in fact a cath lab nurse. She worked in a cardiac catheterization lab. She had palpitations and thought she should get AF ablation. Um, she presented with intractable dyspnea, right side of pleuritic chest pain three months after ablation. No atrial fibrillation but her symptoms had deteriorated significantly. And when I saw her, it was the week before Christmas, she was on 80 milligrams BD of uh, oral frizomide. This is a person who has normal left ventricular function, um, normal renal function, her urea was right up, and a chest x-ray showed focal, focal pulmonary edema. And a CT scan suggested that the inferior pulmonary vein was in fact occluded. This is a chest scout chest x-ray. You can see there's an effusion here. There's a loss of volume in the right lower lung and some congestion of the veins. And this is what her... Um, this is what her MRI and her CT showed. Now, CT actually suggests that it looked like it was completely gone. But you'll see on the MRI here, um, I hope I haven't missed it, there it is there, there is actually a tight stenosis, but it hasn't in fact gone. And if you um, replay this again, you'll see that a, what a normal pulmonary vein looks like on the MRI study that started coming in here into the left atrium. That's what her, her upper vein looks like. And then you see here the lower vein, tightly stenosed, but patent. So we had some optimism that we might be able to fix this. And lo and behold, on the toe, and again, this raises these cases, illustrate the importance of multiple imaging modalities to identify this pathology and guide the intervention. You can see a very high-grade stenosis, turbulent flow in that vein. Um, you can see the Doppler for the echo aficionado showing very high continuous velocities in that pulmonary vein, which is very different to what you'd normally be expecting to see when you do a toe on these on a, on a pulmonary vein. You can see that on the screen there as you look at it on the right, the normal one where there's laminar flow, wide open orifice, and on the left, tight stenosis, turbulent flow, high velocities. Um, so we were optimistic we might be able to get in and we needed to do it ASAP because I thought that vein was about to close down. So the 3D echo has really been a boon for us interventionists because it really helps us guide our procedures. And you can see we can safely and very a very targeted way place our transeptal punctures. We can put these large sheaths very safely through the septum and then these directionable catheters from the EP environment, the gelus catheters, were able to steer right around and down onto the stenosis to make life a lot easier for us. And then in this lady we were again able to wire that lesion and place in a stent and reopen her pulmonary vein. And you can see uh, that the stent there is, uh, we've made sure we've got the ostium certainly, we've got a little bit of stent hanging into the left atrium, we now got lemma flow, mm -hmm. velocities are down, we've got relief of obstruction. And that's a nice little example of how multiple imaging modalities can really assist your procedure. Important for the echo and interventionists in the room to understand how 3D toe can really guide your transeptal puncture, help you negotiate and place your sheath right down upon the pulmonary vein, assist in stent placement, get a precise anatomical localization, um, can tell you if you've got satisfactory deployment, can give you physiological assessment of your result, assess the functional outcome of the intervention. So those imaging modalities are, are very important from a number of aspects. Last case I'll show you, which is a really interesting case, because that last one we thought was almost occluded, and this was a case where it was actually completely occluded by the time we got to the case. And this lady, her diagnosis was delayed because people weren't thinking about it and hadn't put together the symptomatology with the pathology. Um, she's a 47-year-old female with hokum, 
she had previous VT and VF and had a defibrillator in, and as many of these Hocum patients do get atrial fibrillation, and it was quite symptomatic from it, and she'd had two attempts at pulmonary vein isolation. And then she became progressively breathless over six months, culminating a number of hospital admissions with dyspnea, pruritic chest pain, um, and she was desaturated. So she had evidence of focal changes in her lung base. Chest x-rays showed raised hemidiaphragm, collapse of that sort of segment of the lung, and congestion, and a VQ scan was abnormal. People were thinking about all sorts of different things like PE and so on, but it was, it was pulmonary vein stenosis and that was very easily seen on the CT. Um, very focal, high-grade stenosis of the left lower pulmonary vein. Um, and we went in, I thought uh, it was interesting, I had a total car turned up to do some left atrial appendages on this day, and I had this on before to show him something interesting. And so he left because he had other things to do and went down the tea room. But uh, he did come back because uh, we were still going many hours later because when I went in to have a look at it, um, pulmonary vein was completely occluded. You can see that here pretty convincingly. This is what a normal pulmonary vein should look like and this is what uh, a completely occluded one looks like. And so we thought, well, what are we going to do now? Because this lady's got very few options and uh, clearly uh, it's quite a, a tricky spot to be in. So I thought, well, why don't we take some of the techniques that we've learned in coronary intervention using interventions for chronic total occlusions and adapt it to this situation and see if we can get it back open. So we did that and we used um, some Japanese wires that we used for chronic total occlusion and the same sorts of techniques and we were able to get across the occlusion and, and start to reopen the vessel and this is a Miracle 3 which is a, a strategy that I've used as a standard sort of wire, anti-grade wire escalation strategy for a coronary total occlusion adapted for the pulmonary venous circulation. And we're able to get a small balloon across, dilate it up and subsequently serially dilate that open and then I was able to put a stent in and re-establish flow in the pulmonary vein. And you can see here on the right the stent being inflated and you can see how constricted and fibrotic that uh, occlusion was. as even a little residual there that we post later. So these are very fibrotic reactions as a result of uh, you know, radio frequency burn essentially. Um, and then repeat angiography at the end. You can see the collaterals that have started to develop to try and get up to the other lung segments. And uh, we are re, re um, establishing venous drainage to that lobe and our hope was that this would then recruit the collaterals over time and perhaps improve the symptoms and this is a nice 3D echo shot of all those relationships and where the stent was sitting and the pot, at the end of the case we, we had established some flow back in that vein and we thought we were hopeful that she would uh, be able to re um, re-establish a, a functional pulmonary vein which she did and now we have several years of follow-up and the symptoms are resolved. So I think it is possible to recanalate these. Having said that, when Cyborg came back, he was thrilled with the case and he went home and I caught up with him some time later and he said, um, you know, I was so thrilled, uh, I did one at home and I ended up rupturing the vein into the left chest. And uh, um, so he thought that that uh, wasn't such a good idea after that. <laughs> anyway, that was an interesting little story. But in summary, pulmonary vein stenosis is uncommon complication of AF ablation, it's difficult to treat. There's a lot of value in using all those multiple modalities of imaging to help you assess these patients because they can be successfully managed percutaneously and particularly ECHO is very useful in guiding the intervention and monitoring the results of the outcome of your percutaneous strategy. Thank you very much.